Now, the Princess Consensus Panel um, is a group of uh, cardiologists, neurologists, and endocrinologists who convene occasionally. And the last uh, Princeton panel actually met in uh, several years ago in 2015 to produce the Princeton 3 panels. And so the Princeton 4 panel is basically built upon the foundations of the previously found conclusions that talk about the relationship between erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease. The take home message is, is that anything that is heart healthy is penis healthy and vice versa. Hi, my name is Toby Kohler. I'm a urologist at Mayo Clinic here in Rochester, Minnesota. Very excited to talk a little bit about uh, upcoming uh, publication in Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled The Princeton for Consensus Recommendations for the Management of Erectile Dysfunction and Cardiovascular Disease. So this particular uh, paper is kind of a review of all the modern literature. The updates, uh, in a nutshell, and the take-up messages are the following. Number one, we now have irrefutable evidence that erectile dysfunction can be very predictive of heart disease. Thus, it's absolutely essential that we ask our patients about erectile dysfunction because it is the most um, predictive and uh, potentially life-saving question we can ask of young men if they have erectile dysfunction. We do know that most men who have heart attacks don't have any obvious signs or overt signs before they have their first episode. So indeed, the penis can actually predict a cardiac event typically three to five years ahead of time. Uh, other updates from Pr Princeton 3 include uh, how to treat and manage patients that come to you once you've established if they have erectile dysfunction. That is, is sex safe in men that have a cardiac history? And how do we actually screen and go about and referring patients, et cetera, when we have this potential cardiovascular disease that's found from erectile dysfunction. The main difference in Princeton 4 is that in men at um, intermediate or low risk um, for cardiovascular disease based on the SCBD risk calculator should get a coronary calcium score based on having erectile dysfunction. Also, the article talks about optimizing PD-5 use or phosphodiesterase inhibitors. These drugs are now just have had their 25 year anniversary and they have a really good safety profile. Uh, however, taking them and prescribing them have a couple of tips and tricks that we can help optimize you know, patient success when we use this kind of uh, therapy after lifestyle changes fail. Uh, also, very interesting new data, which is described in the paper to some detail, is the fact that PD5 PD inhibitors, in fact, may be protective when taken consistently and help prevent heart attacks. So very interesting data there and randomized trials need to be done in the future, but some thought-provoking evidence. This table you can see is very busy, but I'd like to bring your attention to the relative risks found from all these different trials. So this is 25 years worth of data and we see that men who have erectile dysfunction, typically if they're gonna have a heart attack, uh, it happens three to five years after they develop their erections. Now, not all ED predicts heart disease, not all men who have MIs have ED. However, it is be the best predictive sign that young men have, and older men as well, to see that, yeah, maybe that there's something brewing underneath the surface. In general, the relative risk of a cardiovascular event, including death or MI or the need for intervention or stents or surgery, is about two and a half fold those compared to men without problems with erections. Erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular risk factors have this huge overlap. In this panel, we see an obese man smoking, eating a donut with a cardiac calcifications versus a fit man you know, doing bicep curls, eating an apple and being very healthy. And indeed, men who exercise will prevent problems with erections and prevent problems with cardiovascular disease. Men with a healthy diet will do the same. Men who have High blood pressure will have more ED, more CVD. Men who have high lipids have more ED, more CVD. Obesity, smoking, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, coronary calcium load, and testosterone levels all similarly will predict or prevent a cardiovascular disease and erectile dysfunction, respectively. Now, this next figure from the paper talks about the cardiovascular workup of men with vasculogenic ED. So the algorithm is quite simple. You ask men, do you have problems with sex? Do you have problems with erections? If they say yes, then uh, you can calculate a 10-year ASCVD risk. This is an online calculator in which we incorporate smoking status, lipids, age, and et cetera. 
And if you have low risk, that is less than 5%, uh, you're probably okay. However, if you have erectile dysfunction and you have borderline to intermediate risk, and that is defined as anything greater than 5% to 20%, the new recommendations based on the principal four guidelines is that you should get coronary uh, calcium scores, non-invasive CT scan that gives us a coronary calcium burden. And indeed that testing will lead us to either referral to preventative cardiology or emphasis of lifestyle interventions, which are always important anyway, or perhaps high intensity statins. What about patients who have ED and they also have heart disease? Is sex safe? In general, the metabolic equivalence to have uh, intercourse is three to four mets. And that's the same as being able to walk a mile in 20 minutes on a flat surface or climb up a couple of flights of stairs without getting short of breath or having angina in a reasonable pace, right? So as long as they can do those things, sex is generally safe. If you're unsure about a patient's ability to walk a mile in 20 minutes, you can always get a stress test. And if that puts them into the low risk category, you can go ahead and treat erectile dysfunction and they can have sex safely. If on the other hand, uh, they're in the high risk category, then it's better to refer that patient to a cardiologist before you treat the ED. The other thing that often comes up with erectile dysfunction treatment is the interaction between nitrates and PD-5 inhibitors. And indeed, we know that there is still a contraindication to take them together. However, we know that there are better medications for angina than nitrates often, and often we can get the prescription taken away or um, unprescribed, if you will, so that it's safe to take PD-5 inhibitors. And that's gonna be something that your patients are gonna to want to do because PD-5 inhibitors are very safe, very effective, and indeed may be cardioprotective. But it turns out that PD-5 inhibitors may have influence on um, atherosclerosis, on endothelial function and dysfunction, platelet aggregation, et cetera. You can see here the many uh, tidbits of advice you can give to patients to help optimize their efficacy. Typically, you want to check a testosterone and optimize that. You want to have them trial the drug at least eight times. You want to have them take the drugs on an empty stomach if they're using a shorter-acting drug. Uh, probably the easiest way to, to give this medication is to use a, a longer-acting drug, such as Tadalafil, which is a daily dose form. And the article does go into other treatments for erectile dysfunction and tips and tricks of what patients can try if they're struggling. It's really important that we use the treatment of a sexual dysfunction as a fulcrum to promote lifestyle change in behavior. Often we can get patients to exercise more, eat right, lose weight. They know that sexual function is on the line. And that, of course, is going to uh, increase their overall longevity as well. So thanks for listening to me talk about this Princeton 4 consensus panel. Uh, it's a pleasure and uh, see you next time. We hope that you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mailclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com mail proceedings or general updates on Facebook www.facebook.com Mayo Clinic Proceedings. You can also follow us on X formerly known as Twitter available at Mayo Proceedings. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research, published by Elsevier Incorporated. All rights are reserved, including those for text and data mining, AI training, and similar technologies.